Good morning. I'm glad to see you in worship on this chilly morning. I thought, well, attendance might be lower because Floridians are not used to cold. So I said, God, would you give a special blessing to everyone who shows up today? So you, you came to the right place. I'm glad you're here. We are still in the season of Epiphany, which means we're open to seeing things from a new light. We're open to surprises. So I'm glad you're here with us on worship and also glad for those who are with us online. Um, draw your attention to um, birthdays and anniversaries. Not to put anyone on the spot, but special attention to Frank St. Pierre. Um, and I was at Inbetweeners last night, which was very well attended. There's about 40 people there. It was a, a wonderful crowd. Uh, so congratulations to those who organized that and did such a good job. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to see the people uh, come together. I have uh, one more announcement that uh, Libby will be sharing. Good morning. I am here on behalf of Adult Education Committee to tell you that we would like you to join us next Sunday after worship in the Narthex for not just feeding the soul, but stretching the mind. So we're going to present to you our slate of what we have for our winter semester for all the offerings that we're going to have here at Pine Shores. But we'd like to join you for have you join us for sort of a simple lunch and a really a great time for us to share what we've been thinking and to hear your thoughts about what you'd like to see in the coming year. So please join us in the Narthex next Sunday, right after worship. No excuses. You're going to walk right through there. So we hope that you join us again. We will feed your soul, feed your tummy, and stretch your mind. So let us still ourselves for worship.
that we ourselves are not good enough or pure enough, but still we come together to worship God. Both in our and in our striving, we come to seek God's face, to hear the word proclaimed, and to sing praise. Renew and refresh us, O God, and begin anew your ministry in us. Let us pray. Creator of life, you are active in the deep darkness of winter. You encircle us with your peace in the silence of this frozen season. Help us trust in what we cannot see. Break us open to grow in new ways as we long to hear your voice this hour. Teach us to love in the way and the spirit of Jesus. Amen. And please, if you're able, stand with me and join us in singing I Ring the Power of God, hymn number 32. Let us pray together. We are foolish enough to think God does not know our hearts, hear our words, see the mistakes we make, and the pain that we cause. But God is not only holy, but also gracious and forgiving. Let us now prepare our hearts as we pray together. Loving God, you invite us to believe the way of Jesus, to mend and heal to feed and free, to bring good news. We hear your word of hope, but let bad news overwhelm us. We are silent in the face of injustice. We ignore the poor, oppressed, and neglected. Help us hear your invitation anew, and give us the courage and compassion to follow the way of love. Amen. God's grace is poured out on everyone. God's hope is freely shared in every moment. Forgiveness is the gift which mends our foolish lives. We are surrounded by God's love and mercy, and to the very end, thanks be to God.
Adeline. Come on down. It's good to see you. It just occurred to me, I think you're my favorite Adeline in the whole world. Um, we are talking about a scripture passage today, really early in Jesus' ministry, uh, where he's calling his first disciples. Disciples are people that will be following him. And one of the things he does is he comes to some fishermen, and he says, I am going to make you fishers of people. That's a, a well-known thing, fishers of men, fishers of people. It's something that we talk about a, a lot in the church. Um, but I, I had a, a funny feeling. I'm guessing, are you a fisherman? I, I can see the wheels turning. Okay, I'm just going to guess that you're not a fisherman. Correct, correct. And so... I got this idea. Do you know why I think Jesus said to them, I'm going to make you fishers of people? Do you know why you think he said that? I think he said it because he was talking to, to fishermen. He was talking to fishermen. So he says, I'm going to make you fishers of people. And so I, I started thinking, well, hmm, what, what would Jesus say to Adeline? Since you're not a fisherman, are you an elementary school student? Okay, well, maybe Jesus would say, I'm going to make you an elementary school student of people. Maybe God wants you not to become something different, but God wants you to be exactly who you are and, and to follow him. And part of what that means is to getting, getting other people to follow as well. So you, you have more of a responsibility than you are aware of. So if you don't have to be a fisher of people, you can be an elementary school child of people to show Jesus' light and where you are in your school and the area that you know best. Something to think about. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for Adeline and we thank you for the great love that you have for her and that you're planting in her a love for this church and for following you. Uh, help her to, to be a model of following you to others so that wherever she is, uh, people may see your light. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.
That was beautiful. Thank you, choir. Uh, let us pray together. Lord God, we thank you for this chance to gather as your people of hope on this brisk morning to be able to come together and feel your warmth through one another and your presence with us. God of new visions, we pray for people highly placed in power, that they may focus their eyes on you. And we pray for the lowly victims of power, that they may also focus their eyes on you. We pray for those who bless with their lips, but curse with their mouths, including ourselves. We pray for those who are ill, who need your healing touch. In particular, we pray for Beverly Bailiff and Carolyn Blum this day. We pray for those facing the end of life. Give them the gift of prayer that they may pour out their hearts to you. We pray for the church and for the session of this church that we may hear and respond to your call to be fishers of people. Rock of our salvation through Christ and by your Holy Spirit, bring us into the new world that you are shaping, even as this old world is passing away. Hear us now as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite Libby to come forward for uh, a moment as part of our stewardship series. Catch the vision. As we journey through the stewardship season during this time of epiphany, the stewardship committee has identified some pillars, and today the pillar we're going to discuss is outreach. And when you think about this, I googled it, and the first example that Google gives as a definition for outreach is the living outreach of God to the world. What a blessed thing to think about, how we reach out to the world, share our vision, share our knowledge of God with the world. And Pine Shores has been extraordinary in their mission and their outreach for their history. And we are known for a church that excels at mission and our mission team now led by George is doing fantastic things. And these are the intentional things we do, the things that we, um, the All Face Food Bank, the Francis House, all the things that we intentionally give to, both locally and globally, we think about that. But we think about this park that we've created for the community. And you see the use that we get for this, where we have strollers and dog walkers and we have a prayer garden the labyrinth, gazebo. We have two lending libraries, thanks to Tomas and Sam, one for adults, one for children, playground. All of these things show the world who we are and show the community how we see ourselves and how we welcome them to join us. So there are so many intentional things that we do for outreach that are part of who we are. But if, if we remember, we are the church. We do not come to church. We are the church, and we are the face of the church in the community and the world. So all of these things that we do as we carry forth in our daily lives, we don't even understand some of the impact that we have on people. And it reminds me of the story of Elsie Brucker. Some years ago, Pine Shores received a very sizable donation. Somebody's estate was left to Pine Shores. That was Elsie Brucker. Nobody knows who she is. So somehow Pine Shores has touched this woman so much, and she saw the love of God through us. We don't know how. We don't know how we touched her. Was it at the sunrise service at the beach? Was it somebody kind to her in the grocery store, somebody holding an umbrella for you? We don't know what it was, but you have to know that we make an impact, 
and that what we bring from this place out into the world matters. And we need to catch that vision. When Christ throws that to us, we need to take it and run with it. And that's for all of us to catch that vision and realize that we're all implicated in outreach, we're all implicated in mission, and we're all implicated in bringing the joy, the good news of Christ to everyone that we we touch. And I'm reminded on Christmas Eve, the candlelight service, one light illuminates this entire building. When you think about the one candle and that all of us feed off that one candle, creating these, these beautiful blocks of light. And we can do that in the community, and we need to do that as Pine Chores and as members of this faith community. So please join me, catch the vision. Welcome to Pine Chores. Thank you, Libby. Uh, your story reminds me this past week I was walking out of the office and uh, mother and father and stroller was coming into the prayer garden and they, they looked like they were caught by surprise to see somebody and they said, is it okay if we use the playground? And I said, of course, that's what it's here for. And they just big smiles came across their face. So uh, just echoing what Libby said, uh, we do make a difference in this community. Um, and also with regards to the stewardship campaign, just a reminder again that the first Sunday in February is when we will be uh, inviting you to be returning your pledge cards. So we've had the high view of stewardship. Now is uh, the time to give. God is our rock and our fortress, so let us celebrate our salvation by fearlessly giving a portion of what has already been given to us. Let us give openly. Would you pray with me? Merciful God, you have saved us for a purpose. We dedicate these gifts as we dedicate our lives to you that you will make us fishers of people. Amen.
don't know if the word name Frederick Beekner is familiar to you. He's familiar to Presbyterian pastors, I can assure you. He himself uh, was a pastor and a, a well-known writer and seems to often be quoted by Presbyterian pastors. So I have just a little kind of reflection that shows his lively use of language as he reflects on the nature of the kingdom of God. If the world is sane, then Jesus is mad as a hatter, and the Last Supper is the mad tea party. The world says, mind your own business, and Jesus says, there is no such thing as your own business. The world says, follow the wisest course and be a success, and Jesus says, follow me and be crucified. The world says, drive carefully, the life you save may be your own. And Jesus says, whoever would save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The world says, law and order. And Jesus says, love. The world says, get. And Jesus says, give. In terms of the world's sanity, Jesus is as crazy as a coot, and if anybody who thinks we can follow him without us being a little crazy too, is laboring less under a cross than under a delusion. Let us join together on our hymn of preparation, God is Calling Through the Whisper. We're in the Gospel of Mark today, right at the beginning. Mark chapter 1, we'll be starting at verse 14. Now, after Jesus was arrested, and after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Ze Ze Zebedee, and his brother John, 
who were in their boat mending notes, nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Would you pray with me? Lord God, open our minds as we long to dig into your word, words that are in some respect common, but words that we really need to reflect upon. Help us to hear your word to us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, with the lectionary, we have an option of being in Mark for the next couple of weeks, so I thought this would be a good time to lay a foundation to try to understand how he thinks. Uh, But it's also an opportunity to reflect on what, what do we think? What do we think? Though we may still have uh, Christmas on our mind, Mark, the, the oldest of the Gospels, doesn't start with any of those old, familiar Christmas stories. There's no star, no shepherd, no wise men. The story begins with this wild John the Baptist, and then, bam, we begin with Jesus launching his ministry and calling his first disciples. Now, if you've been hanging around Christian street corners long enough, uh, this story is going to sound very familiar. At the same time, if we can just allow our, our racing minds to slow down a little bit, we've got to admit that this passage is full of important words and phrases that we might be hard-pressed to define. We might need to think about this a little bit. For example, twice in the first two verses, we hear the well-known term, good news. So what is the good news? I, I would be ever so curious to find out how you would answer that question. What does the good news mean to you? I mean, part of me wants to accost you on your way out the door and hear everyone's answer to that. Not going to do that. Just a thought. But if someone stopped you on the street and asked you why you attended Pine Shores Presbyterian, I would hope that you would have some, some good news to share. So what is the good news about your personal faith? I wonder how you would articulate that. If you were to ask many Christians what the good news of Jesus was, I bet many would say, oh, the hope of heaven. But surely there is more than that going on here. This is at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, And there, to this point, has been no hint of any discussion about the cross or heaven. Even so, Jesus is insisting there's good news to share. So can you identify that good news, this side of heaven? Think about it. If it was only a story about Jesus, the perfect Lamb of God dying, then we could have saved some time by just allowing Jesus to be slaughtered by Herod along with the rest of the infants. But no, he was not. No, I expect there was something more. Since we're only six days from Martin Luther King Day, let me throw in a quote that that I think is related Martin Luther King writes, I have watched many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which makes a strange, unbiblical distinction between body and soul, between the sacred and the secular. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. 
end quote. Like Jesus, I can see that Martin Luther King was committed to good news in the here and now. One clue that there is something more than that comes in in verse 14 where it is highlighted that Jesus is proclaiming the good news of God. He doesn't say the good news of Jesus. He says the good news of God. Later it says believe in this good news. So what is the good news? Apparently this good news has something to do with the kingdom of God which comes up again. But what is that all about? Let's define our terms. Many people talk, uh, these days talk about entering the kingdom of God as though they were talking about going to heaven, but that doesn't make sense in this context here. It doesn't sound like Jesus is proclaiming the good news of going to heaven. After all, he seems to suggest that whatever this kingdom is, It has come near. It's come near. And since it has come near, it appears that the implication is that we are to repent. Another word needing definition. Now, what does that mean? Are we to feel bad about naughty things that we've done? Are we to fess up because the judgment is at hand? Let me, let me tell you how I would read some of these words and phrases that we think that we know so well. We might find some clues by understanding Mark's grammar. How many people love studying grammar in school? Silence. When he says the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near, both of those verbs are in the perfect tense which means it has both already happened and it has an ongoing effect in the present. It's already happened and has an ongoing effect in the present. So much more than a warning of some cataclysmic event that's about to happen, understanding this correctly implies that we need eyes to see something that has already happened and its effect is continuing in the present. If this then is the case, then repent does not have the sense of airing your dirty laundry before judgment. Rather than a moralistic sense of repenting, the invitation here is to change your way of thinking. An epiphany. Change your way of thinking. Wrap your minds and imaginations around this new reality. And this is my invitation to you as well. I want to try to describe this kingdom of God and I want you to try to open your minds to this new way of seeing things. Repent. Sort of as an interesting footnote here, this phrase, the kingdom of God, is is rare in the Gospel of John, but it's really an important concept for Mark and Luke, so it's worth our taking the time and energy to grapple with. I would invite you to think of the kingdom of God as that arena where the will of God has taken hold. That arena where the will of God has taken hold, where the, where the power of God is being manifest. So in in the spirit of epiphany, we might look around us and discern where the power of God is being manifest in, in changed lives, both individually and communally, where the presence of God is making a difference, where it can be seen. That is where the kingdom of God is where the intentions and the priorities of God are being brought to fruition, that is where the kingdom of God is. To be clear, this is not meant in any passive sense, but in the sense of the divine 
actually being involved and on some level messing with us. We, we should also learn from Mark how the kingdom of God is framed in distinction from the kingdom of the world. Both phrases are used. Whereas the church has often been complicit in terms of reinforcing and benefiting from the kingdoms of this world, the biblical notion of the kingdom of God is always seen most clearly in distinction from the kingdom of the world. The kingdom of God represents a kind of intrusion into the world, and the world it's going to resist that kind of intrusion. So as you can see, the, the stage is set for some conflict. Now I'm a little bit self-conscious that we've spent a lot of time on only two verses, but I think laying a foundation here is important. You might need to repent. That is, to see things from a new perspective in order to get it, in order to grasp this good news. The truth is, however, that those ground under by the heel of empire have always been best positioned to perceive this good news. So I feel a need to jump ahead and, and get into these verses uh, 16 through 20, the call of the first disciples Many a sermon has been preached about the calling the fishermen and how they drop their nets immediately and follow Jesus. But ra rather than a line-by-line -line analysis of this passage, I would want to take a high view. I, I once read an author who referred to the three B's of the church, and the order is significant. Believing, behaving, belonging. Believing, behaving, belonging. In the church where I was raised, like many of you, your starting point with a church revolved around believing the right things. After that, we addressed behaving, that is, proper Christian behavior. I remember a line, I don't drink and I don't chew and I don't go with girls who do. That so we concerned ourselves with issues like dancing and swearing and what you're not supposed to do when you're dating. So then after you believed the right things and then behaved in a certain way, then we could start talking about belonging, about joining the church. But this story of Jesus calling the first disciples suggests that maybe we got the order all wrong. Maybe. Jesus starts with belonging. He simply says to his disciples, follow me. He doesn't interview them on their knowledge of the scriptures or their individual belief systems. He simply says, follow me. Though working class fishermen, he doesn't take time to make sure they don't talk like truck drivers. He simply says, follow me. It all starts with relationships. And over the years, change happens. As I think about it, this, this approach might fit well with Pine Shores Presbyterian, rather than moving from believing to behaving and then to belonging, we start with belonging. We, we start with an invitation to belong, not in an organizational membership sense, but by offering a deep sense of belonging. You belong here. We issue an invitation. Won't you just join us? Won't you come to dinner tonight? We don't grill you on your beliefs or research your drinking habits. We simply say, won't you walk this road with us? Now, it's not that behaving is inconsequential, but rather than imposing certain standards on you, 
through the relationships that you have formed here, you might discover your behavior mysteriously changing. Through walking the road with others here, you might wake up one day to the realization that, you know, I might have an unhealthy relationship with money, for example. And you mysteriously start becoming a more generous individual. Who knows, starting with a a safe, secure sense of belonging and then being surprised how you were seemingly behaving differently, you just might end up believing differently. Strange things happen when you start walking in the way and in the spirit of Jesus. And you know what? When you reflect on all the ways that you changed since associating with this community that chooses welcome, you have discovered what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God. And the more you realize how you have slowly and subtly changed over time, all without burdensome New Year's resolutions, you simply smile and you look around and you think, God, this is good news. This is good news. And you know what? Once you realize that you are on a path of good news, you start seeing things differently. When you see something in the world that is totally out of whack with God's vision, you develop a sense of an urgency to respond to that somehow. You're you're less inclined to dispassionately say, well, that's something to think about. Finally, like James the fisherman, you might have such a sense of a new call in life that you're willing to even be a disappointment to your father, Zebedee. I know you had expectations of me, Dad, but I'm marching to a different drumbeat now, and I hope you'll understand someday. Quote, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Amen. Let us join together in this affirmation of faith written, just a fragment of this affirmation written in 1977 about the Christian mission God sends us to proclaim the gospel. God sent his son to proclaim release to those who were bound to announce that God's promised kingdom is at hand, to urge everyone to repent and believe the good news. The Lord is moving toward the time when the glorious liberty of the children of God will be manifest throughout the whole creation. We testify God is at work here and now when people obey Christ's commission to witness to him and to make disciples of all nations when they spread the good news by their words and embody it in their lives. Let's join together in our closing hymn, Lord, you have come to the lake shore.
repent and believe the good news is God with us, God calling us for a purpose. Now may that you sense the God of second chances renew your sense of call and inspire you to go out and share the good news of forgiveness and hope. Amen.